Hello everyone, I am Dandalia, the Dandelion VTuber, and today we are going to be doing reading from the works of Edgar Allan Poe. We've got five short stories that we're going to cover today, and also some discussions in between. I hope that you guys are excited, as excited as I am. Let's begin, shall we? There it is. Now, we are starting with the oval, po port the oval portrait. Now, if you want to be following along, I would follow along over here. Whoa, wrong thing. Okay. There we go. Oh. Not the right thing. Why is it? Okay. I was trying to make the toolbar go away, but the it F11 is not working for uh, the ebook reader for whatever reason. It, it's just not this. It, it's having a disagreement with OBS, I think. So if you want to follow along, uh, I would follow along over here because for whatever reason, this it works. It'll it'll go like this where the where this will go over here as I turned the page. All right. Let's begin. The Oval Portrait by Edgar Allan Poe. The Sacho the chateau into which my valet had ventured to make forcible entrance rather than permit me in my desperately wounded condition to pass a night in the open air was one of those piles of commingled gloom and grandeur which have so long frowned among the Apennines, not less in the fact that in the fancy of Mrs. Radcliffe. To all appearance it had been temporarily and very lately abandoned. We established ourselves in one of the smallest and least sumptuously furnished apartments. It lay in a remote turret of the building. Its decorations were rich, yet tattered and antique. Its walls were hung with tapestry and bedecked with manifold and multiple, multiform armorial trophies, together with an unusually great number of very spirited modern paintings in frames of rich golden arabesque. In these paintings, which deepened from the walls, not only in their main surfaces, but in very many nooks in which bizarre architecture of the chateau rendered necessary. In these paintings my incipient delirium, perhaps, had caused me to take deep interest, so that I bid Pedro to close the heavy shutters of the room, since it was already night, to light the tongues of a tall candelabrum which stood by the head of my bed, and to throw open far and wide the fringed curtains of black velvet which enveloped the bed itself. I wished all this done so that, that I might resign myself, if not to sleep, at least alternatively to the contemplation of these pictures, and the perusal of a small volume which had been found upon the pillows, and which purported to criticize and describe them. Long, long I read, and devoutly, devotedly I gazed, Rapidly and gloriously the hours flew by, and the deep midnight came. The position of the candelabrum displeased me, and outreaching my hand with difficulty, rather than disturb my slumbering valet, I placed it so as to throw its rays more fully upon the book. The action produced an effect altogether unanticipated. The rays of the numerous candles— for there were many, now fell within a niche of the room which had hitherto been thrown into deep shade by one of the bedposts. I thus saw in vivid light a picture all unnoticed before. It was the portrait of a young girl just ripening into womanhood. I glanced at the patient painting hurriedly and then closed my eyes. Why I did this was not at first apparent even to my own perception. But while my lids remained thus shut, I ran over in my mind my reason for so shutting them. It was an impulsive movement to gain time for thought, 
to make sure that my vision had not deceived me, to calm and subdue my fancy for a more sober and more certain gaze. In a very few moments I again looked fixedly at the painting. That I now saw aright I could not and would not doubt, for the first flashing of the candles upon that canvas had seemed to dissipate the dreamy stupor which was stealing over my senses, and had to startle me at once into waking life. The portrait, I have already said, was that of a young girl. It was a mere head and shoulders, done in what is technically termed a viginette manner, much in the style of the favorite heads of Sully. The arms, the bosom, and even the ends of the radiant hair melted imperceptibly into the vague yet deep shadow which formed the background of the whole. The frame was oval, richly gilded and filigreed in moresque. As a thing of art, nothing could be more admirable than the painting itself. But it could have been neither the execution of the work, nor the immortal beauty of the countenance which had so suddenly and so vehemently moved me. Least of all, could it have been that my fancy, shaken from its half-slumber, had mistaken the head for that of a living person. I saw at once that the peculiar peculiarities of the design, of the, viginet, of, of the vignetting, and of the frame, must have instantly dispelled such idea, must have prevented even its momentary entertainment. Thinking earnestly upon these points, I remained, for an hour perhaps, half sitting, half reclining, with my vision riveted upon the portrait. At length, satisfied with the true secret of its effect, I fell back within the bed. I had found the spell of the picture in an absolute life-likeliness of expression, which, at first startling, finally confounded, subdued, and appalled me. With deep and reverent awe, I replaced the candelabrum in its formal, former position. The cause of my deep agitation thus being thus shut from view, I sought eagerly the volume which discussed the paintings and their history. Turning to the number which designated the oval portrait, I there read the vague, quaint root words which follow. She was a maiden of rarest beauty, and not more lovely than full of glee. And evil was the hour when she saw and loved and wedded the painter. He, passionate, studious, austere, and already a bride in his art. She a maiden of rarest beauty, and not more lovely than full of glee all light and smiles, and frolicsome as the young fawn, loving and cherishing all things, hating only the art which was her rival, dreading only the palette and brushes and other untoward instruments which deprived her of the countenance of her lover. It was thus a terrible thing for this lady to hear the painter speak of his desire to portray even his young bride, but she was humble and obedient and sat meekly for many, m week, for many weeks in the dark, high turret chamber where the light dripped upon the pale canvas only from overhead. But he, the painter, took glory in his work, which went on from hour to hour, from day to day. And he was a passionate and wild and moody man who became lost in reveries, so that he would not see that the light which fell so ghastly in that lone turret withered the health and spirits of his bride, who pined visibly to all but him. Yet she smiled on and still on, uncomplainingly, because she saw that the painter, who had high renown, took a fervid and burning pleasure in his task, and wrought day and night to depict her who so loved him, yet who who grew daily more dispirited and weak. And in sooth, some who beheld the portrait spoke of its resemblance in low words, as of a mighty marvel, and a proof not less of the power of the painter than of his deep love for her, whom he depicted so surpassingly well. But at length, as the labor drew nearer to its conclusion, there were admitted none into the turret, 
for the painter had grown wild with the ardor of his work and turned his eyes from the canvas merely, even to regard the countenance of his wife. And he would not see the hints, he would not see that the tints which he spread upon the canvas were drawn from the cheeks of her who sate beside him. And when many weeks had passed, and but the little remained to do, save one brush upon the mouth and one tint upon the eye, the spirit of the lady flickered up as the flame within the socket of the lamp. And then the brush was given, and then the tint was placed, and for one moment the painter stood entranced, entranced before the work that he had wrought. But in the next, while he yet gazed, he grew tremulous and very pallid and aghast, crying with a loud voice, This is indeed life itself! turned suddenly to regard his beloved. She was dead. <laughs> I think, like, my thoughts on this, like, I do I find it so fascinating the way just the concept of stealing the life like we as people learn and build on the experiences that our forefathers carved for us and art is no different um there are elements of this that feel like a like a product of its time because like i feel like the concept of like art stealing aspects of what it's created i feel like i've seen that like that story told many times before. Uh, it there was a particular, like, like stealing the life of what it is portraying. I feel like there was a Bailey school kids book that had like a similar concept of like stealing colors and things like that. Yeah. Do you think that? And I I think it's interesting that you could imagine. Either way, is it magical or is it mundane? Do you think that she wasted away from general neglect or that he literally imbued her soul into the painting by accident? I think that the latter is more interesting. I, they're both fascinating concepts because uh, it's very likely that, you know, she was based on the time since it's like just burgeoning into womanhood. I would imagine that he married like a teenager somewhere within the age of like 15 to 17, like a still growing girl uh, who, who needs like more food than necessarily like a grown woman, or perhaps she was freshly like, like she was actually pregnant at the time. Uh, and that also requires different nutrients as well. Um, and particularly like, the moment when it's talking about like he won't let anyone in because he's so busy on his work and so it's just her and him and it's possible that like he wasn't getting up for food and so neither was she but honestly I think in any other situation I think it's wonderful that he wanted to include his wife in his hobby you know hobby slash job more likely I guess if he can afford to have a mansion, he was either someone who was very well off and could afford to be an artist, which is more likely for the time period, considering the Oval Portrait came out in, uh, he released it in 1842. Because uh, artists simply, like, unless you got sponsored by someone high up, like, you're... Artists don't exactly, like, in any age, get a whole lot of money. I think that it's a little bit different now because there's, like, status involved. Um, but there is just, like... So it's, it probably was more likely that he had, like, a hobby that he was obsessed with. And I think it's nice that he wanted to include his wife in something that he was passionate about. I think that's really healthy for a relationship. But... The thing is, the moral of the story is work-life balance. Work-life balance. <laughs> oh. 
but yeah, like, <laughs> okay. And, and my brain was just like, uh, my warped little dandy brain was like, hmm, beautiful woman painting. Do you think he wanked? <laughs> Yay or nay? Second question, like, little, little, little one out of fear. You know, try one sometime. Just try one sometime. Maybe, maybe clowns. Maybe clowns. Little picture clowns. Have a good time. Let us continue to the next picture. The, the next one. The next one we shall be reading. As soon as I open it. We shall be reading as I thought. I just had to check my list. Rechecking my list, checking it twice. We will be reading The Black Cat. The Black Cat by Edgar Allan Poe. For the most wild yet most homely narrative which I am about to pen, I neither expect nor solicit belief. Mad indeed would I be to expect it, in a case where my very senses reject their own evidence. Yet mad I am not. And very surely do I not dream. But tomorrow I die, and today I will unburthen my soul. My immediate purpose is to place before the world, plainly, succinctly, and without comment, a series of mere household events. In their consequences, these events have terrified, have tortured, destroyed me. Yet I will not attempt to expound them. To me, they have presented little but horror. To many, they will seem less terrible than Baroque's. Hereafter, perhaps, some intellect may be found which will reduce my phantasm to the commonplace, some intellect more calm, more logical, and far less excitable than my own, which will perceive, in the circumstances I detail with awe, nothing more than an ordinary succession of very natural causes and effects. From my infancy I was noted for the docility and for the docility and humanity of my disposition. My tenderness of heart was even so conspicuous as to make me the jest of my companions. I was especially fond of animals, which was indulged by my parents with a great variety of pets. With these I spent most of my time, and was never so happy as when feeding and caressing them. This peculiarity of character grew with my growth. What? Where, where did I lost my... Yeah. And in my manhood, I derived it from one of my principal sources of pleasure. To those who have cherished an affection for a faithful and sagacious dog, I need hardly be, the be at the trouble of explaining the nature or the intensity of the grati gratification thus derivable. There is something in the unselfish and self-sacrificing love of a brute, which goes directly into the heart of him who has a f had frequent occasion to test the paltry friendship and gossamer fidelity of mere man. I married early, and was happy to find in my wife a disposition not uncongenial with my own. Observing my partiality for domestic pets, she lost no opportunity of procuring those of a most of the most agreeable kind. We had birds, goldfish, a fine dog, rabbits, a small monkey, and a cat. This latter was a remarkably large and beautiful animal, entirely black and sagacious to an astonishing degree. In speaking of his intelligence, my wife, who at heart was not a little tinctured with superstition, made frequent allusion to the ancient popular notion, which regarded all black cats as witches in disguise. Not that she was ever serious upon this point, 
and I mention the matter at all for no better reason that it happens just now to be remembered. Pluto, this was the cat's name, was my favorite pet and playmate. I alone fed him, and he attended me whenever I went about the house. It was even with difficulty that I could prevent him from following me through the streets. Our friendship lasted in this manner for several years, during which my general temperament and character, through the instrumentality of the fiend intemperance, had, I blush to confess it, experienced a radical alteration for the worst. I grew, day by day, more moody, more irritable, more regardless in the feelings of others. I suffered myself to use intemperate language to my wife. At length, I even offered her personal violence. My pets, of course, were made to feel the change in my disposition. I not only neglected, but ill-used them. For Pluto, however, I still regained sufficient regard to restrain me from maltreating him, as I made no scruple of maltreating the rabbits, the monkey, or even the dog, when, by accident or through affection, they came in my way. But, Plu but my disease grew upon me, for what disease is like alcohol? And at length even Pluto, who was now becoming old, and consequently somewhat peevish, even Pluto began to experience the effects of my ill temper. One night, returning home, much intoxicated, from one of my haunts around town, I fancied the cat that the cat avoided my presence. I seized him, when, in his frights at my violence, he inflicted a slight wound upon my hand with his teeth. The fury of a demon instantly possessed me. I knew myself no longer. My original soul seemed at once to take its flight from my body, and a more than fiendish malevolence, gin-nurtured, thrilled every fiber of my frame. I took from my waistcoat pocket a penknife, opened it, grasped the poor beast by the throat, and deliberately cut one of its eyes from the socket. I blush, I burn, I shudder while I pen the damnable atrocity. When reason returned with the morning, when I, have sl when I had slept off the fumes of the night debauch, I experienced a sentiment half of horror, half of remorse for the crime of which I had been guilty, but it was, at best, a feeble and equivocal feeling, and the soul remained untouched. Again I plunged into excess, and soon drowned in wine all memory of the deed. In the meantime, the cat slowly recovered. The socket of the lost eye presented, it is true, a frightful appearance, but he no longer appeared to suffer any pain. He went about the house as usual, but, as might be expected, fled in extreme terror at my approach. I had so much of my old heart left as, it, as to be at first grieved by his by this evident dislike on the part of such a creature which had once so loved me. But this feeling soon gave place to irritation. And then it came... Where did, where did it go? Sorry. Hold on a minute. Where did it go? Ah, but this feeling soon gave place to irritation. And then came, as if to my final and irrevocable overthrow, the spirit of perverseness. Of this spirit philo philosophy takes no account. Yet I am not sure, I am not, yet I am not more sure that my soul lives than I am that perverseness is one of the primitive impulses of the human heart, one of the individual indivisible primary faculties or sentiment which gives direction to the character of man who has not a hundred times found himself committing a vile or silly action for no other reason than because he knows he should not have we not a perpetual inclination in the teeth of our best judgment to violate that which is law merely because we understand it to be such this spirit of perverseness, I say, came to my final overthrow. 
It was this unfathomable longing of the soul to vex itself, to offer violence to its own nature, to do wrong for the wrong sakes only, that urged me to continue and finally to consummate the injury I had inflicted upon the unoffending brute. One morning, in cool blood, I slipped a noose around its neck and hung it to the limb of a tree, hung it with terror, hung it with tears streaming from my eyes and with the bitterest remorse at my heart, hung it because I knew that it loved me and because I felt it had given me no reason of offence, hung it because I knew that in so doing I was committing a sin, a deadly sin that would so jeopardize my immortal soul as to place it, if such a thing were possible, even beyond the reach of the infinite mercy of the most merciful, merciful and most terrible God. On the night of the day on which this cruel deed was done, I was aroused from sleep by the cry of fire. The curtains of my bed were in flames. The whole house was blazing. It was with great difficulty that my wife, a servant, and myself made our escape from the conflagration. The destruction was complete. My entire worldly wealth was swallowed up, and I resigned myself thenceforward to despair. I am above the weakness of seeking to establish a sequence of cause and effect between disaster and atrocity. But I am detailing a chain of facts, and which not wish not to leave even a possible link imperfect. On the day succeeding the fire, I visited the ruins. The walls, with one exception, had fallen in. This exception was found in a compartment wall, not very thick, which stood about the middle of the house, and against which had red rested the head of my bed. Plastering had there, in great measure, resisted the action of the fire, a fact which I attributed to its having, recent, having been recently spread. About this wall a dense crowd were collected, and many persons seemed to be examining a particular portion of it with very minute and eager attentions. The words strange, singular, and other similar expressions excited my curiosity. I approached and saw, as if graven in bas relief upon the white surface, the figure of a gigantic cat. The impression was given with an accuracy truly marvelous. There was a rope about the animal's neck. When I first beheld this apparition, for I could scarcely regard it as less, my wonder and my terror were extreme. But at length reflection came to my aid. The cat, I remembered, had been hung in a garden adjacent to the house. Upon the alarm of fire, this garden had been immediately filled by the crowd, by some of whom the animal must have been cut from the tree and thrown, through an open window, into my chamber. This had probably been done with the view arousing me from sleep. The falling of other walls had compressed the victim of my cruelty into the substance of the freshly spread plaster, the lime of which, with the flames and the ammonia from the carcass, had then accomplished the portraiture as I saw it. Although I thus readily accounted to my reason, if not altogether to my conscience, for the startling fact just detailed, it did not the less fail to make a deep impression upon my fancy. For months I could not rid myself of the phantasm of the cat, and during this period there came back into my spirit a half-sentiment that seemed, but was not, remorse. I went so far as to regret the loss of, an, of the animal, and to look about me among the vile haunts with, which I now habitually had frequented, for another pet of the same species, and of somewhat similar appearance, with which to supply its place. One night, as I sat, half stupefied, in a den of more than infamy, my attention was suddenly draw, 
drawn to some black object, reposing upon the head of one of the immense hogsheads of gin or of rum, which cons constituted the chief furniture of the apartment. I had been looking steadily at the top of this hogshead for some minutes, and what now caused me surprise was the fact that I had not set I had not sooner perceived the object thereupon. I approached it and touched it with my hand. It was a black cat, a very large one, fully as large as Pluto, and closely re resembling him in every aspect but one. Pluto had not a white hair upon any portion of his body, but this cat had a large, although indefinite, splotch of white, covering nearly the whole region of the breast. Upon my touching him, he immediately arose, purred loudly, and rubbed against my hand, and appeared delighted with my notice. This, then, was the very creature of which I was in search. I at once offered to purchase it of the landlord, but this person made no claim to it, knew nothing of it, had never seen it before. I continued my caresses, and when I prepared to go home, the animal evinced a disposition to accompany me. I permitted it to do so, occasionally stopping and patting it as I proceeded. When it reached the house, it domesticated itself at once, and became immediately a great favorite with my wife. For my own part, I soon found a dislike to it arising within me. This was just the reverse of what I had anticipated, but... I now, I know not how or why it was, its evident fondness for myself rather disgusted and annoyed. By slow degrees, these feelings of disgust and annoyance rose into the bitterness of hatred. I avoided the creature. A certain sense of shame and the remembrance of my former deed of cruelty preventing me from physically abusing it. I did not, for some weeks, strike or otherwise violently ill use it, but gradually, very gradually, I came to look upon it with unutterable loathing, and to flee silently from its odious presence, as from the breath of pestilence, of a, as from the breath of a pestilence. What added, no doubt, to my hatred of the beast, was the discovery, on the morning after I brought it home, that, like Pluto, it had also been deprived of one of its eyes. This circumstance, however, only endeared it to my wife, who, as I have already said, possessed, to a, possessed in a high degree that humanity of feeling which what ha had once been my distinguishing trait and the source of many of my simplest and purest pleasures. With my aversion to this cat, however, its partiality for myself seemed to increase. It followed my footsteps with a pertinacity which would which it would be difficult to make the reader comprehend. Whenever I sat, it would crouch beneath my chair or spring upon my knees, covering me with its loathsome caresses. If I arose to walk, it would get between my feet and thus nearly throwing me down or fastening its long and sharp claws in my dress clamor in this manner to my breast. At such times, although I longed to destroy it with a blow, I was yet withheld from so doing, partly by a memory, partially, partly by a memory of my former crime, but chiefly, let me confess it at once, by my absolute dread of the beast. This dread was not exactly a dread of physical evil, and yet I should be at, lo at, at a loss how otherwise to define it. I am almost ashamed to own, yes, even in this felon cell, I am almost ashamed to own that the terror and horror with which the animal inspired me had been heightened by one of the merest chimeras it would be possible to conceive. My wife had called my attention more than once to the character of the mark of white hair, of which I had spoken, and which constituted the sole visible difference between the strange beast that I had once destroyed. The reader will remember that this mark, although large, had been originally very indefinite, but by slow degrees, degrees nearly imperceptible, and which for a long time my, region, my reason struggled to reject as fanciful, it had at length assumed a rigorous distinctness of outline. 
I was now the representation of an object that I shuddered to name, and for this, above all, I loathed and dreaded, and would have rid myself of the monster had I dared. It was now, I say, the image of a hideous and ghastly thing. Of the gallows! Oh, mournful of, and, oh, mournful and terrible engine of horror and crime, of agony and death! And now I was indeed wretched beyond the wretchedness of mere humanity, and a brute beast whose fellow I had contemptuously destroyed, a brute beast to work out for me, for me a man fashioned in the image of the high God, so much of insufferable woe. Alas, neither by day nor by night knew I the blessing of rest any more. During the former the creature left me no moment alone, and in the latter I started hourly from dreams of an unutterable fear to find the hot breath of the thing upon my face, and its vast weight, an incarnate nightmare that I had no power to shake off, incumbent eternally upon my heart. Beneath the pressure of torments such as these, the feeble remnant of the good within me succumbed. Evil thoughts became my sole intimates, the darkest and most evil of thoughts. The moodiness of my usual temper increased to hatred of all things and of all mankind, while from the sudden, frequent, and ungovernable outbur outbursts of a fury to which I now blindly abandoned myself. My uncomplaining wife, alas, was the most usual and the most patient of sufferers. One day she accompanied me, upon some household errand, into the cellar of the old building which our property, poverty compelled us to inhabit. The cat followed me down the steep stairs, and, nearly throwing me headlong, exasperated me to madness. Uplifting an axe, uplifting an axe, and forgetting, in my wrath, the childish dread which had hitherto stayed my hand, I aimed a blow at the animal which, of course, would have proved instantly fatal had it descended as I wished. But this blow was arrested by the hand of my wife, goaded by the interference into a rage more than demoniacal. I withdrew my arm from her grasp and buried the axe in her brain. She fell dead upon the spot without a groan. This hideous murder accomplished, I set myself forthwith and with entire deliberation to the task of concealing her body. I knew that I could not remove it from the house, either by day or by night, without the risk of being observed by the neighbors. Many projects entered my mind. At one period I thought of cutting the corpse into minute fragments and then destroying them by fire. At another, I resolved to dig a grave for it in the floor of the cellar. Again, I deliberated without casting it in the about casting it in the well in the yard, about packing it in a box as if merchandise, with the usual arrangements, and so getting a porter to take it from the house. Finally, I hit upon what I considered a far better expedient than either of these. I determined to wall it up in the cellar as the monks of the Middle Ages are recorded to have walled up their victims. For a purpose such as this, the cellar well was, was adapted. Its walls were loosely constructed and had lately been plastered throughout with a rough plaster, which the dampness of the atmosphere had prevented from hardening. Moreover, in one of the walls was a projection, caused by a false chimney or fireplace that had been filled up and made to resemble the red of the cellar. I made no doubt that I could readily displace the bricks at this point, insert the corpse, and wall the whole up as before. Wall the whole wall. Yeah, wall the. Wall the whole up as before, so that no eye could, could detect anything suspicious. And in this calculation, I was not deceived. By means of a crowbar, I easily dislodged the bricks, and having carefully deposited the body against the inner wall inner wall, I propped it in that position, while with little trouble I relayed the whole structure as it originally stood. Having procured mortar, sand, and hair, with every possible precaution, I prepared
I accidentally pressed the arrow key and I lost my spot. Um, having procured mortar, sand, and hair, with every pro possible precaution, I prepared a plaster which could not be distinguished from the old, and with that, with this, I was very, I very carefully went over the new brickwork. When I had finished, I felt satisfied that all was right. The wall did not present the slightest appearance of having been disturbed. The rubbish on the floor was picked up with the minutest care. I looked around triumphantly and said to myself, Here, at least then, my labor has not been in vain. My next step was to look for the beast which has been... My next step was to look for the beast which had been the cause of so much wretchedness, for I had, at length, firmly resolved to put it to death. Had I been able to meet with it at the moment, there could have been no doubt of its fate, but it appeared that the crafty animal had been alarmed at the violence of my previous anger, and forbore to present itself in my present mood. It is impossible to describe or to imagine the deep, blissful sense of relief which the absence of the detested creature occasioned in my bosom. It did not make its appearance during the night, and thus, for one night at least, since its introduction into the house, I soundly and tranquilly slept. I slept even with the burden of murder upon my soul. The second and third day passed, and still my tormentor came not. Once again I breathed as a free man. The monster, in terror, had fled the premises forever. I should behold it no more. My happiness was supreme. The guilt of my dark deed disturbed me but little. Some few inquiries had been made, but these had not been readily answered. Even my search had been instituted, but of course nothing was to be so nothing was to be discovered. I looked upon my future felicity as secured. Upon the fourth day of the assassination, a party of the police came, very unexpectedly, into the house and proceeded again to make rigorous investigation of the premises. Secure, however, in the inscrutability of my place of concealment, I felt no embarrassment whatever. The officers bade me accompany them in their search, they left no nook or corner unexplored. At length, for the third or fourth time, they descended into the cellar. I quivered not in a muscle. My heart beat calmly as that of one who slumbers in innocence. I walked the cellar from end to end. I folded my arms upon my bosom and roamed easily to and fro. The police were thoroughly satisfied and prepared to depart. The glee at my heart was too strong to be restrained. I burned to say if but one word by way of triumph and to render doubly sure their assurance of my guiltlessness. Gentlemen, I said at last as the party ascended the steps, I delight to have allayed your suspicions. I wish you all health and a little more courtesy. By the by, gentlemen, this, this is a well-constructed house. In the rapid desire to say something easily, I scarcely knew what I uttered at all. I may say an excellently well-constructed house. The, these walls, are, are you going, gentlemen? These walls are solidly put together. And here, through the mere frenzy of bravado, I rapped heavily, with a cane which I held in my hand, upon that very portion of brickwork behind which stood the corpse of my wife of my bosom. But may God shield and deliver me from the fangs of the arch-fiend! No sooner had the reverberation of my blows sunk into silence than I was answered by a voice from within the tomb. A cry, at first muffled and broken, like the sobbing of a child, and then quickly swelling into one long, loud, and continuous scream, utterly anomalous and inhuman. A howl, a wailing shriek, half of horror and half of triumph, such as might have arisen only out of hell, conjointly from the throats of the damned in their agony and of the demons that exult in the damnation. 
Of my own thoughts it is folly to speak. Swooning, I staggered into the opposite wall. For one instant, the party upon the stairs remained motionless, through extremity of terror and awe. In the next, a dozen stout arms were toiling at the wall. It fell bodily. The corpse, already greatly decayed and clotted with gore, stood erect before the eyes of the spectators. Upon its head, with red extended mouth and solitary eye of fire, sat the hideous beast whose craft had seduced me into murder and whose informing voice had consigned me to the hangman. I had walled the monster within the tomb. Why am I just, why am I so low? There we go. <laughs> Shorty got low, 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 low. <laughs> also, I switched to the wrong screen. Neat. Love that. I hope that you guys were still able to follow along vocally. I am dreadfully sorry for accidentally clicking on the wrong scene. But let's discuss it, shall we? This is an interesting work. The Black Cat came out in 1843. And I think that this is an interesting work to talk about because um, the 1800s, uh, during the 1800s, particularly like the 1820s, 1840s and onward, was there was a big shift occurring. Uh, there was a big shift in the way alcohol was viewed culturally, which was actually a, like people think that like the prohibition like the prohibition was in the 1920s, but pe like I believe 1921 to 1929, people don't realize that the movement that led to the prohibition started around this time period. And you can see that, like that influence heavily affecting this work. See, before the 1820s or so, alcohol was as American as apple pie. It was a very, it was like a cornerstone of American culture. You drank with every meal. You drank on your work break. Small towns and such even had infrastructure to ring a bell for booze breaks. And your, your, your job would supply a cup of beer. You drank if you won. You drank if you lost. You drank to seal a business deal. You drank to prove you were a man. You drank at the saloons to kick back after a long day's work, uh, drinking and playing cards with the men. Saloons weren't just the equivalent, equivalent of the modern day bar. Uh, there was infrastructure. You could set it up so that you could get your mail there. You could pay your bills there. And of course, the, it was a big social avenue for a man of age. Plus, women, and I believe children, were banned from saloons, allowing men the freedom to drink as much as they wanted, and no one could stop them. The infrastructure of the time made it a lot easier to be an alcoholic than not. Um, that alcohol level, like, some of this wasn't that big of a deal. Like, like back before the 1800s, uh, the more common alcohols were like ales and meads and light beer, things with very low alcohol proofing. But around the time of the 1840s or so, like, like 1800s, there was a shift to the, the resources were there and there was a shift from those really, really light alcohols to really, really high alcohol content stuff like whiskey, scotch, and gin, which if you have that, like, like that alcohol level, that drinking culture, that infrastructure, and tie it together with the expectation that you're supposed to drink or you're not a true man, you have yourself a drunkard. You have yourself like a very critical alcoholic. Um, 
there was like a very like there are statistics of like a lot of people that were literally drinking themselves to death uh you, you know like the the there was a high uptick of people who had been drinking themselves to death uh who were waste who were going to the saloon after work and pretty much using all of like using all of their money on gambling and booze uh, and possibly prostitutes. I can't remember whether saloons did have prostitutes or not, or whether that's a spaghetti western stereotype. Um, but, like, and people would come home uh, drunk off their butt and beat their wife and have gambled away all the money and stuff. And there just wasn't knowledge about, like, what alcohol actually how it actually alters behavior the misunder there was a misunderstanding and lack of knowledge about how alcohol makes a man behave how, how it makes people behave um at the time people didn't really understand that like to an extent like it pretty much like releases inhibitions and like they assumed and hoped that not that like they assumed and honestly hoped that if they removed alcohol from the equation corruption would end You'd like, but the thing is that they, it, alcohol more releases inhibitions rather than turn someone into a sinister person. Eliminating, eliminating alcohol doesn't create a perfect world. But back to the story, I think that like, that's part of why I, I think that movement that was starting in like the 18... I believe it started like right around like the 1820s, 1830s, 1840s. And this is like right in the center of that or, or the beginning. So like, I wonder how much this story was influenced. I, I would guess that it was influenced by the time. If I remember correctly, Edgar Allan Poe was not like a, like he was someone who became very influential after his death and he died penniless but if i'm wrong i wonder how much how much his work affected the people of the time or how much his work was affected by the things that were going on uh in the prohibition movement of the 1800s and the other question do you think it's magic perhaps circumstance? Was he being magically influenced by an evil feline or spirit disguised as one? Or was the cat initially good in enacting revenge or just, just a cat? <laughs> I, to me, my opinion, I, I think that maybe his intent, like death of the author aside, you know, when you read things, you create your own narrative in your mind your own imagination partially based on what the author wrote but also partially interpreting it based on your own experiences and for my experiences like I think that he was someone who like I don't think he was magically influenced by an evil spirit I think like maybe uh it's easy to like look at the story and think of it as like happenstance for me. But I do think that it's in like I think it's interesting of like having it the cat was initially good and the the cat was enacting revenge. Like do you think that like the, the, that's the second question for you guys. Do you think the two cats were the same cat or like the like admittedly like they do have nine lives after all, you know, uh, it, it, it could be possible that like, but in the lore of the story, this was like the cat's second life and they chose, you know, I'm going to get him <laughs> using like black cat magic is maybe like the uh, intent of the author. The other question that I have to ask you guys, do you think he's truly repentant? or lying from his cell to in an effort to get good with God before he goes, or perhaps get out of his execution entirely. Personally, my interpretation is that he's lying his butt off. This kind of thing of like, oh, it was the magic of my, of the phantasm of my evil cat. I, I think that that, like, that, that, to me, that's in character. 
And like, I think that he's, to me, when I read it, I feel like when he's talking about like how wonderful he was to animals, that like he was lying. And uh, maybe always had like sort of an affinity for like not being 100% kind to animals and the alcohol just served as a booster, uh, an, an, an inhibitor to allow him to enact that level of violence and maybe cause some paranoia near the end of it. Um, but yeah, no, a lot of people psychologically, uh, the people that end up being murderers as adults are the ones who like when they're a kid they will kill animals without more remorse or like animals first and then they move on to people later in life which is what makes me think that like the fact that he was able like i don't i've never drank alcohol before and maybe that like take that information with what you will like i can't i can't drink for medical reasons Excuse me. Um, but like, take that with take that information from which you will. I think that. Okay, I have no idea what I was just saying. My brain just went boop. Um, but I don't think alcohol is enough to drive. I remember now. Alcohol, I don't think, is enough of a driving factor to to make you carve out your cat's eyeball with a knife. That's beyond the pale. I think that a certain, like, unless you're like, I don't that there's a certain level of love that prevails, I think. Like, there's just things that you just don't do, no matter how much of a drink you have. But I don't know, I've never, I've never really drank and some of my opinions are just because I've never really been around a whole lot of people who drink. So forgive me if I'm if I'm wrong. <laughs> if you're like, hey, I, I have experience. You're wrong. But, you know, to each their own, you know? All right. Let's head to... Let's start the next story. Actually, let me get some water first. Oh, it's time to take my medicine right on time. Okay, got my water, got my water. <clears throat> oh shit, I mean, <laughs> I didn't mute it, sorry. I didn't mute my mic, I wasn't thinking. I try to mute my mic and like keep it down low, but I've got GERD. It's just an acid reflex thing. And so whenever I drink a lot of water, it always makes me burp. So please excuse me. All right. Let us begin, shall we? The fall of the House of Usher. During the whole of a dull, dark, and soundless day in the autumn of the year, when the clouds hung oppressively low in the heavens, 
I had been passing alone on horseback through a singularly dreary tract of country, and at length found myself, as the shades of the evening drew on, within the view of the melancholy house of Usher. I know not how it was, but with the first glimpse of the building a sense of insufferable gloom pervaded my spirit. I say insufferable, for the feeling was unrelieved by any of the half-pleasurable, because poetic sentiment with which the mind usually receives even the sternest natural images of the desolate or terrible, I looked upon the scene before me, upon the house and the simple landscape features of the domain, upon the bleak walls, upon the vacant eye-like windows, upon a few rank sedges, and upon a few white trunks of decayed trees, with an utter depression of soul which I can compare to no earthly sensation more properly than to the after-dream of the reveller upon opium, the bitter lapse into everyday life, the hideous dropping of the veil. There was an iciness, a, sink, a sinking, a sickening of the heart, an unredeemed dreariness of thought which no goading of the imagination could torture into aught of the sublime. What was it, I paused to think, what was it that so unnerved me in the contemplation of the house of Usher? It was a mystery all insoluble, nor could I grapple with the shadowy fancies that crowded upon me as I pondered. I was forced to fall back upon the unsatisfying conclusion that, while beyond doubt there are combinations back upon the unsatisfactory conclusion, whoops, there are combinations of very simple natural objects which have the power of thus affecting us. Still, the analysis of this power lies among the considerations beyond our depth. It was possible, I reflected, that a mere arrangement of particulars of the scene, of the details of the picture, would be, insuff would be sufficient to modify, or perhaps to annihilate its capacity for, so for sorrowful impression, and acting upon this idea... I reined my horse to the precip precip precipitous brink of a black and lurid tarn that lay unruffled that lay in unruffled luster by the dwelling, and gazed down, but with a shudder even more thrilling than before, upon the remodeled and inverted images of the grey sedge, and of and the ghastly tree stems and the vacant and eye-like windows. Nevertheless, in this mansion of gloom I now proposed myself a sojourn of some weeks. Its proprietor, Roderick Usher, had been one of my boon companions in boyhood, but many years had elapsed since our last meeting. A letter, however, had lately reached me in a distant part of the country, a letter from him, which, in its wildly importunate nature, had admitted me no other than a personal reply. The MS gave evidence of nervous agitation. The writer spoke of acute bodily illness, of a mental disorder which oppressed him, and of an earnest desire to see me as his best and indeed his only personal friend, with a view of attempting, by the cheerfulness of my society, some alleviation of his malady. It was the matter in which all this and much more was said. It was the apparent heart that went with, this, went with his request, which allowed me no room for hesitation, and I accordingly obeyed forthwith what I considered a very singular, singular summons. Although, as boys, we had been even intimate associates, yet I really knew little of my friend. His reserve had always been, his, his reserve had been always excessive and habitual. I was aware, however, that his very ancient family had been noted, time out of mind, for a peculiar sensibility of temperament, displaying itself through long ages in many works of exalted art, and manifested of late in repeated deeds of munificent yet unobtrusive charity, as well as in a passionate devotion, devotion to the intricacies, perhaps, even more than to, than to the orthodox and easy recognizable beauties, of musical science. I had learned, too, the very remarkable fact that the stem of the Usher race 
all time honored as it was, had put forth at no period any enduring branch. In other words, that the entire family lay in the direct line of descent, and had always, with very trifling and very temporary fa variation, so lain. It was this deficiency I considered while running over the thought of the perfect keeping of character, of the premises with the accredited character of the people, and while speculating upon the possible influence with the one in the long last lapse of century might have exercised upon the other. It was this deficiency, perhaps, of collateral issue, and the consequence and deviating transmission from sire to son, of the patrimony with the name which had at length so identified the two as to merge the original title and the estate of the quaint and equivocal appellation of the House of Usher, an appellation which seemed to include in the minds of the peasantry who used it both the family and the family mansion. I have said that the sole effect of my somewhat childish experiment, that of looking down within the tarn, had been to deepen the first singular impression. There can be no doubt that the consciousness of the rapidness, rapid increase of my superstition, for why should I not term it, served mainly to accelerate the increase itself. Such, I have long known, is the paradoxical law of all sentiments having terror as a basis. And it might have been for this reason... Hmm. And it might have been... Sorry, there was a... I don't know whether you could hear it, but the garage went up and I wanted to like pause so that like someday in the future, I would like to someday in the future, I would like to take this and like edit it like and make it like a reading. So it's just the book itself and none of the mistakes. But, you know, anyway. There can, be, there can be no doubt that the consciousness of the rap rapid increase of my superstition, for why should I not so term it, served mainly to accelerate the increase itself. Such, I have long known, is the paradoxical law of all sentiments having terror as a basis. And it might have been for this reason only that when I again uplifted my eyes to the house itself from its image in the pool, there grew in my mind a strange fancy, a fancy so ridiculous indeed that I but mention it to show the vivid force of the sensations which oppressed me. I had so worked upon my imagination as really to believe about the whole mansion and domain there hung in the atmosphere so peculiar to themselves and their immediate vicinity, an atmosphere which had no affinity with the air of heaven, but which had reeked up from the decayed trees, the grey wall, and the silent tarn, a pestilent and mystic vapour, dull, sluggish, faintly discernible, and leaden-hued. Shaking off from my spirit what must have been a dream, I scanned more, nar more narrowly the real aspect of the building. Its principal feature seemed to be that of excessive antiquity. The discoloration of ages had been great. Minute fungi overspread the whole exterior, hanging in the fine tangled webwork from the eaves. Yet this, yet all this was apart from any extraordinary dilapidation. No portion of the masonry had fallen, and there appeared to be a wild inconsistent thing. Accidentally pressed a button. There we are. Yet all this was apart from any extraordinary dilapidation. 
No portion of the masonry had fallen, and there appeared to be a wild inconsistency between its still perfect adapt adaptation of parts and the crumbling condition of the individual stones. In this there was much that reminded me of the spe specious totality of old woodwork which has rotted for years in some neglected vault, with no disturbance from the breath of the external air. Beyond this indication of extensive decay, however, the fabric gave little token of instability. Perhaps the eye of scrutinizing of, of an Perhaps the eye of a scrutinizing observer might have discovered a barely perceptible fissure which, extending from the roof of the building in front, made its way down the wall in a zigzag direction until it became lost in the sullen waters of the tarn. Noticing these things, I rode over a short causeway to the house. A servant-in-waiting took my horse, and I entered the gothic archway of the hall. A valet of stealthy step thence conducted me in silence through many dark and intricate passages in my progress to the studio of his master. Much that I encountered on the way contributed, I know not how, to heighten the vague sentiments of which I have already spoken. While the objects around me, while the carvings of the ceilings, the somber tapestry of the walls, the ebon blackness of the floors, and the phantasmagoric armorial trophies which rattled as I strode, were but matters to which, or to such as which, I had been accustomed from my infancy. While I hesitate not to acknowledge how familiar was all this, I still wondered to find how unfamiliar were the fancies which ordinary images were stirring up. On one of the staircases, I met the physician of the family. His countenance, I thought, wore a mingled expression of low cunning and perplexity. He accosted me with trepidation and passed on. The valet now threw open a door and ushered me into the presence of his master. The room in which I found myself was very large and lofty. The windows were long, narrow, and pointed, and at so vast a difference distance from the black oaken floor as to be altogether inaccessible from within. Feeble gleams of encrimsoned light made their way through the trellis panes, and served to render sufficiently distinct the more prominent objects around. The eye, however, struggled in vain to reach the remoter angles of the chamber or the recesses of the vaulted and fretted ceiling. Dark draperies hung upon the walls. The general furniture was profuse, comfortless, antique, and tattered. Many books and musical instruments lay scattered about, but failed to give any vitality to the scene. I felt that I had breathed I felt that I breathed an atmosphere of sorrow, an air of stern, deep, and irredeemable gloom hung over and pervaded all. Upon my entrance, Usher arose from a sofa which he had been lying at full length and greeted me with a vivacious warmth which had much in it, I at first thought, of an overdo overdone cordiality, of the constrained effort of the Inui man of the world. A glance, however, at his countenance convinced me of his perfect sincerity. We sat down, and for some moments, while he spoke not, I gazed upon him with a feeling half of pity, half of awe. Surely a man had never before so terribly altered in so brief a period as had Roderick Usher. It was with difficulty that I could bring myself to admit the identity of the wan being before me with the remarkable, or with the with the companion of my early boyhood. Yet the character of his face had been at all times remarkable. A cadaverousness of complexion, an eye large, liquid, and luminous beyond comparison, lips somewhat thin, very pallid, but of a surpassingly beautiful curve, a nose of delicate Hebrew model, but with a breadth of nostril unusual in similar formations, a finely moulded chin speaking in its want of prominence, of a want of moral energy. Hair a 
of a more than web-like softness and tenuity, these features, with an inordinate expansion above the regions of the temple, made up altogether a countenance not easily to be forgotten. And now, in the mere exaggeration of the prevailing character of these features, and of the expression they, ne they were wont to convey, lay so much a change that I doubted to whom I spoke. The now ghastly pallor of the skin, and the now miraculous luster of the eye, above all things startled and even awed me. The silken hair, too, had been suffered to grow all unheeded, and as, in its wild gossamer texture, it floated rather than fell about the face. I could not, even with effort, connect its arabesque expression with any idea of simple humanity. In the manner of my friend I was at once struck with an incoherence, an inconsistency, and I soon found this to arise from a series of feeble and futile struggles to overcome a habitual trepidancy, an excessive nervous agitation. For something of this nature I had indeed been prepared, no less by his letter than by reminiscence, reminiscences of certain boyish traits, and by conclusions deduced from his peculiar physical conformation and temperament. His action was alternately vivacious and sullen. His voice varied rapidly from a tremulous indecision, when the animal spirit seemed utterly in abeyance, to that species of energetic concision, that, un that abrupt, weighty, unhurried, and hollow-sounding enunciation, that leaden, self-balanced, and perfectly modulated guttural utterance, which may be observed in the lost drunkard, or the irreclaimable eater of opium, during the periods of his most intense excitement. It was thus that he spoke of the object of my visit, of his earnest desire to see me, and of the solace he expected me to afford him. He entered at some length into what he conceived to be the nature of his malady. It was, he said, a constitutional and a family evil, and one for which he despaired to find a remedy, a mere nervous affection, he immediately added, which would undoubtedly soon pass off. It displayed itself in a host of unnatural sensations. Some of these, as he detailed them, interested and bewildered me, although perhaps the terms and the general manner of the narration had their weight. He suffered much from a morbid acuteness of the senses, the most insipid food was alone endurable. He could only wear garments of certain texture. The odors of all flowers were oppressive. His eyes were tortured even by faint light, and there were but peculiar sounds, and these from string instruments, which did not inspire him with horror. To an anomalous species of terror I found him a bounden slave. I shall perish, said he. I must perish in this deplorable folly. Thus, thus, and not otherwise, I shall be lost. I dread the events of the future, not in themselves, but in their results. I shudder at the thought of any, even the most trivial, incident, which may operate upon this intolerable agitation of soul. I have indeed no abhorrence of danger except in its absolute effect, in terror, in this unnerved, in this pitiable condition, I feel that the period will sooner or later arrive when I must abandon life and reason together in some struggle with the grim phantasm, fear. I learned, moreover, at intervals and through broken and equivocal hints, another single feature of his mental condition. He was enchained by certain superstitious impressions in regard to the dwelling which he tenanted, tenanted, and whence for years he had never ventured forth. For many years he had never ventured forth in regard to an influence whose sup Suppositous force was conveyed in terms too shadowy here to be restated, 
an influence which some peculiarities in the mere form and substance of his family mansion had, by din, dint of long sufferance, he said, obtained over his spirit. An effect with the physique of the grey walls and turrets, and of the dim tarn into which they all looked down, had, at length, brought upon the morale of his existence. He admitted, however, although with hesitation, that much of the peculiar gloom which thus afflicted him could be traced to a more natural and far more palpable origin, to the severe and long-continued illness, indeed to the evidently approached dissolution of a tenderly beloved sister, his sole companion for long years, his last and only relative on earth. Her decease, he said, with a bitterness I could ne I can never forget, would leave him, him the hopeless and the frail, the last of the ancient race of the Eilers. While he spoke, the Lady Madeline, for so she was called, passed slowly through a remote portion of the apartment, and without having noticed my presence, disappeared. I regarded her with utter astonishment, not unmingled with dread, and yet I found it impossible to account for such feelings. A sensation of stupor oppressed me as my eyes followed her retreating steps. When a door at length closed upon her, my glance sought instinctively and eagerly the countenance of her brother, but he had buried his face in his hands and I could only perceive that a far more than ordinary wine, wanness had overspread the emaciated fingers through which trickled many passionate tears. The disease of the Lady Madeline had long baffled the skill of her physicians. A settled apathy, a gradual wasting away of the person, and frequent although transient affectations of a partially cataleptical character were the unusual diagnosis. Or, hitherto she had steadily borne up against the pressure of her malady, and had not betaken herself finally to bed, but on the closing in on the evening of my arrival at the house, she succumbed as her brother told me at night with inexpressible agitation, to the prostrating power of the destroyer, and I learned that the glimpse I had obtained of her person would probably be the last I should obtain, that the lady, at least while, li while living, would be seen by me no more. For several days ensuing, her name was unmentioned by either Usher or myself, and during this period I was busy in the earnest endeavors to alleviate the melancholy of my friend. We painted and read together, or I listened, as if in a dream, to the wild improvisations of his speaking guitar. And thus, a, as a closer and still closer intimacy admitted me, more reserved, reservedly into the recesses of his spirit, the more bitterly did I perceive the futility of all attempt at cheering his mind from which darkness, as if an inherent positive quality, poured upon all the objects of the moral and physical universe in one unceasing radiation of gloom. I shall ever bear about me the memory of the many solemn hours I thus spent alone with the master of the house of Usher. Yet should I fail in any attempt to convey an idea of the exact character of the studies, or of the occupations in which he involved me, or led me the way. An excited and highly distempered ideality threw a sulphurous luster over all. His long, improvised dirges will ring forever in my ears. Along with other, among other things, I hold painfully in mind a certain singular perversion and amplification of the wild air of the last waltz of von Weber. From the paintings over which his elaborate fancy brooded, and which grew touch by touch, into vagueness at which I shuddered the more thrillingly, because I shuddered not knowing why. From these paintings, vivid as their image no images now are before me, I would in vain endeavor to induce more than a small portion which should lie within the compass of merely written words. But the utter simplicity 
by the nakedness of his designs, he arrested an overawed attention. If ever mortal painted an idea, that mortal was Roderick Usher. For me, at least, in the circumstances then surrounding me, there arose out of the pure abstractions which the hypochondriac contrived to throw upon his canvas an intensity of intolerable awe, no shadow of which felt I ever yet, of which felt I ever yet in the contemplation of the certainly glowing yet too concrete reveries of Fuseli. One of the phantasmagoric conceptions of my friend, partaking not so rigidly of the spirit of abstraction, may be shadowed forth, although feebly, in words. A small picture presented the interior of an immensely long and rectangular vault or tunnel, with low walls, smooth white and without interruption or device. Certain accessory points of the design served well to convey the idea that this excavation lay at an exceeding depth below the surface of the earth. No outlet was observed in any portion of its vast extent, and no torch or other artificial light was discernible. Yet a flood of intense rays ro rolled throughout and bathed the whole in a ghastly and inappropriate splendor. I have I have just spoken of that morbid condition of the auditory nerve which rendered all music intolerable to the sufferer, with the exception of certain effects of stringed instruments. It was, perhaps, the narrow limits to which he thus confined himself upon the guitar, which gave birth, in great measure, to the fantastic character of his performances. But the fervid facility of his impromptus could not be a so a could not be so accounted for. They must have been, and were, in the notes, as well as in the word of his wild fantasias, for he was not, for he not unfrequently accompanied himself with rhymed verbal improvisations. The result of that intense mental collectedness and concentration to which I have previously alluded as observable only in particular moments of the highest artificial excitement. The words of one of these rhapsodies I have easily remembered. I was, perhaps, the more forcibly impressed with it, as he gave because, in the under or mystic current of its meaning, I fancied that I perceived for the, for, for the first time a full consciousness on the part of Usher of the tottering of his lofty reason upon her throne. The verses which were entitled The Haunted Palace, ran very, ran very nearly, if not entirely, thus. 1. The greenest of our valleys, by good angels tented, tenanted, once a fair and stately palace, radiant palace, reared its head, in the monarch thought's dominion, it stood there. Never seraph spread opinion over fabric half so fair. Er, half so fair. Banners yellow, glorious, golden, on its roof did float and flow. This, all this, was in the olden time long ago. With and every gentle air that dallied in that sweet day, Along the ramparts plumed and pallid, a winged odor went away. Wanderers in that happy valley, through two luminous windows saw, spirits moving musically to a lute's well-turned law, round about a throne where sitting. Porf Phyrogene, in state his glory well befitting, the ruler of the realm was seen. And all with pearl and ruby glowing was the fair palace door, through which came flowing, 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 and sparkling evermore, a troop of echoes whose sweet duty was but to sing, in voices of surpassing beauty, the wit and wisdom of their king. 
but evil things in robes of sorrow assailed the monarch's high estate. Ah, let us mourn for never morrow, shall dawn upon him desolate. And round about his home the glory, that blushed and bloomed, is but a dim-remembered story of the old time entombed. And travellers now within that valley, through red litten windows see, vast forms that move fantastically to a discordant melody, while, like a rapid ghastly river, through the pale door, a hideous throng rush out forever and laugh but smile no more. I, rem I well remember that suggestions arising from this ballad led us into a train of thought where, he where there he became manifest an opinion of Usher's, which I mention not so much on account of its novelty, for other men have thought of this, on account of the pertinacity which he, with which he maintained it. This opinion, in its general form, was that of the sentience of all vegetable things, but in his disordered fantasy, the idea had assumed a more daring character, and trespassed, under certain conditions, upon the kingdom of inorganization. I lack words to express the full extent, or the earnest abandon of his persuasion. The belief, however, was connected, as I have previously hinted, with the grey stones of the home of his forefathers. The conditions of the sentience has, had been there, he imagined, fulfilled in the method of collocation of these stones, in the order of their arrangement, as well as in the many fungi which overspread them, and of the decayed trees which stood around, above all in the long undisturbed endurance of this arrangement, and in its reduplication in the still waters of the tarn. Its evidence, the evidence of the sentience, was to be seen, he said, and here I started as he spoke, in the gradu gradual yet certain condensation of the atmosphere of their own about the waters in the hall. The result was discoverable, he added, in that silent yet importunate and terrible influence which for century centuries had molded the destiny of s destinies of his family, which made him, now as I saw him, what he was. Such opinions need no comment, and I will make none. Watson, Dr. Percival, Sp Sp uh, Spallanzani, and especially the Bishop of Landoff. See Chemical Essays, Volume B. Our books, the books of which for years had formed no small portion of the mental existence of the invalid were, as might be supposed, in strict keeping with this character of phantasm. We pored together over such works as the Revert et Chatros de Gresset, the Belfagor of Machiavelli, the Heaven and Hell of Swedenborg, and the Subterranean Voyage of Nicholas Kim, Klim by Holberg, the Chiromancy of Robert Fudd, of Jean Diagne, and de la Camber the journey into the distance of the teak, and the city of the son of Campanella. One favorite volume was a small octavo edition of the Directorium Inquisitorium by the Dominican Emeric de Giron, and were passages of Pomponius Mella about the old African satyrs and oegipans, over which Usher would sit dreaming for hours. His chief delight, however, was found in the perusal of an exceedingly rare and curious book in quarto Gothic, the manual of a forgotten church, the Vigilane Mortuarium Secundum, Secundum Corum Ecclesiae Magunitae. I could not help thinking of the wild ritual of this work, and of its, probably in, of its probable influence upon the hypo hypochondriac, when one evening, having informed me abruptly that the Lady Madeline was no more, he stated his intention of preserving her corpse for a fortnight, pre previously to its final interment. interment. In one of the numerous vaults within the main walls of the building, 
The worldly reason, however, assigned for this singular proceeding was one which did, I did not feel at liberty to dispute. The brother had been led to his resolution, so he told me, by consideration of the unusual character of the malady of the deceased, of certain unobtrusive and eager inquiries on the part of her medical men, and the remote and exposed situation of the burial ground of the family. I will not deny that when I called to mind the sinister countenance of the person whom I met upon the staircase, on the day of my arrival at the house, I had no desire to oppose what I regarded at best, but a harmless and by no means unnatural precaution. At the request of Usher, I personally aided him in the arrangements for the temporary entombment. The body having been encoffined, we were we two alone bore it to its rest. The vault in which we placed it, and which had been so long unopened that our torches, half smothered in its oppressive atmosphere, gave us little opportunity for investigation, was a small, damp, and entirely without means of admission for light. Lying at great depth, immediately beneath that portion of the building in which was my own sleeping apartment. It had been used, apparently, in remote feudal times for the worst purposes of a dungeon keep and in later days as a place of deposit for powder or some other highly combustible substance as a portion of its floor and the whole interior of a long archway through which we reached it carefully sheathed carefully sheathed with copper. The door of massive iron had been also similarly protected. Its immense weight caused an unusually sharp grating sound as it moved upon its hinges. Having deposited our mournful burden upon trestles within its, this region of horror, we partially turned aside the yet unscrewed lid of the coffin and looked upon the face of the tenant. A striking similitude between the brother and sister now first arrested my attention. An usher, divining perhaps my thoughts, murmured out some few words from which I learned that the deceased and himself had been twins, and that our sympathies of a scarcely intelligible nature had always existed between them. Our glances, however, rested not long upon the dead, for we could not reward her unawed. The disease which had thus entombed the lady in the maturity of youth had left, as usual in all maladies of strictly cataleptical character, the mockery of a faint blush upon the bosom and the face, and that suspiciously lingering smile upon the lip which is so terrible in death. We replaced and screwed down the lid, and, having secured the door of iron, made our way with toil into the scarcely less gloomy apartments of the upper portion of the house. And now, some days of bitter grief having elapsed, an observable change came over the features of the mental disorder of my friend. His ordinary manner had vanished. His ordinary occupations were neglected or forgotten. He roamed from chamber to chamber with hurried, unequal, and objectless step. The pallor of his countenance had assumed, if possible, a more ghastly hue, but the luminousness of his eye had utterly gone out. The, mo the once occasional huskiness of his tone was heard no more. In a tremulous quiver, as if of extreme, terrible, er, <laughs> extreme terror habitually characterized his utterance. There were times, indeed, when I thought his unceasingly agitated mind was laboring with some oppressive secret, to divulge which he struggled for the necessary courage. At times, again, I was obliged to resolve all into the mere inexplicable vagaries of madness, for I beheld him gazing upon vacancy for long hours, in an attitude of the profoundest attention, as if listening to some imaginary sound. It was no wonder that his condition terrified, but it infected me. I felt creeping upon me, by slow yet certain degrees, the wild influences of his own fantastic yet impressive superstitions. 
It was especially upon retiring to bed late in the night of the seventh or eighth day after the placing of Lady Madeline within the dungeon that I experienced the full power of such feelings. Um, sleep came not near my couch while the hours waned and waned away. I struggled to reason off the nervousness which had dominion over me. I endeavored to believe that much, if not all, of what I felt was due to the bewildering influence of the gloomy furniture of the room, of the dark and tattered draperies which, tortured into motion by the breath of a rising tempest, swayed fitfully to and fro upon the walls and rustled uneasily about the decorations of the bed. But my efforts were fruitless. An impressible tremor gradually pervaded my frame, and at length there sat upon my heart a very rising tempest swayed fitfully to and fro upon the walls and rustled uneasily about the decorations of the bed. But my efforts were fruitless. An irrepressible tremor gradually pervaded my frame, and at length there sat upon my heart an incubus of utterly causeless alarm. Shaking this off with a gasp and a struggle, I uplifted myself upon the pillows and, peering earnestly within the intense darkness of the chamber, hearkened, I know not why, except that an instinctive spirit prompted me, to certain low and indefinite sounds which came through the pauses of the storm at long inter intervals I knew not whence. Overpowered by an intense sentiment of horror, unaccountable yet unendurable, I threw on my clothes with haste, for I felt that I should sleep no more during the night, and endeavored to arise myself from the pitiable condition into which I had fallen by pacing rapidly to and fro through the apartment. I had taken but a few turns in this manner when a light step on an adjoining staircase arrested my attention. I presently recognized it as that of Usher. In an instant afterward he was rapped with a gentle touch at my door and entered, bearing a lamp. His countenance was, as usual, cadav cadaverously wan, but moreover there was a species of mad hilarity in his eyes as evidently restrained hysteria in his whole demeanor. His air appalled me anything was preferable to the solitude which I had so long endured, and even welcomed his presence as a relief. "'Have you not seen it?' he said abruptly, after having stared about him for some moments inside it, in silence. "'You have not seen it. Stay. You shall.' Thus speaking, and having carefully shaded his lamp, he hurried to one of the casements, and threw it freely to open to the storm. The impetuous fury of the entering gust nearly lifted us from our feet. It was indeed a tempestu impe tempestuous yet sternly beautiful night, and one wildly singular in its terror and its beauty. A whirlwind had apparently collected its force in our vicinity, for there were frequent and violent alterations in the direction of the wind, and the exceeding density of the clouds, which hung so low as to press upon the turrets of the house, did not prevent our perceiving the lifelike velocity with which they flew careening from all points against each other without passing away into the distance. I say that even their exceeding density did not prevent our perceiving this, Yet we had no glimpse of the moon or stars, nor was there any flashing forth of the lightning. But under the surfaces of the huge masses of agitated vapor, as well as all terrestrial objects immediately around us, were glowing in the unnatural light of a faintly luminous and distinctly visible gaseous exhalation which hung about and enshrouded the mansion. You must not... "'You shall not behold this,' said I, shudderingly to Usher, as I led him with a gentle violence from the window to a seat. 
These appearances, which bewilder you, are merely electrical phenomena, not uncommon. Or it may be that they have their ghastly origin in the rank miasma of the tarn. Let us close this casement. The air is chilling and dangerous to your frame. Here is one of your favorite romances. I will read, and you shall listen, and we will pass away this terrible night together. The ancient volume with which, which I had taken up was the mad tryst of Sir Lancelot Cannon, but I had called it a favorite of Usher's more in sad jest than in earnest, for, in truth, there is little in its uncouth and unimaginative, unimaginative prolixity which could have had interest for the lofty and spiritual ideality of my friend. It was, however, the only book immediately at hand, and I indulged in a vague hope that the excitement, excitement which now agitated the hypochondriac might find relief. For the history of mental disorder is full of similar anomalies. Even in the extremeness of the folly which I should read, could I have judged indeed by the wild, overstrained air of vivacity which with he hearkened, or apparently hearkened, to the words of the tale, I might have well con congratulated myself upon the success of my design. I had arrived that well-known portion of the story while Ethered, the hero of the tryst, having sought in vain for peaceable admission into the dwelling of the hermit, proceeds to make good an entrance by force. Here it will be remembered the words of the narrative run thus. And Ethelred, who was by nature of a doughty heart, and was now mighty withal, on account of the powerfulness of the wine which he had drunken, waited no longer to hold parley with the hermit, who, in sooth, was of an obstinate and maliceful turn, but feeling the rain upon his shoulders, and fearing the rising of the tempest, uplifted his mace upright, and with blows made quickly room in the plankings of the door for his gauntleted hand, and now pulling therewith sturdily, he so cracked and ripped and tore all asunder that the noise of the dry and hollow-sounding wood alrummed and reverberated throughout the forest. At the termination of this, sen at this sentence I started, and for a moment paused, for it appeared to me, although I at once concluded that my excited fancy had deceived me, it appeared to me that, from some very remote portion of the manor mansion, there came indistinctly to my ears what might have been, in its exact similarity of character, the echo, of a stifled and dull one certainly, of the very cracking and ripping sound which Sir Lancelot had so particularly described. It was, beyond doubt, the coincidence alone which had arrested my attention, for, amid the rattling of sashes, of the sashes around the casements, and the ordinary commingled noises of the still-increasing storm, the sound in itself had nothing, surely, with which should have interested or disturbed me. I continued the story. But the good champion Athelred, now entering within the door, was sore enraged and amazed to perceive no signal of the molestful hermit, but instead thereof a dragon of a scaly and prodigious demeanour, and of a fiery tongue which sate in guard before the palace of gold, with a floor of silver, and upon the wall there hung a shield of shining brass with this legend in written, in written Who enteth herein a conqueror hath been, who slayeth the dragon the shield he shall win. And Ethelred uplifted his base, and struck upon the head of the dragon, which fell before him, and gave up his pesty breath, with a shriek so horrid and harsh, and withal so piercing, that Ethelred had feigned to close his ears with his hands against the dreadful noise of it, the like with where hoof was never before heard. Here again I paused abruptly, and now with a feeling of wild amazement. For there could be no doubt whatever that in this instance I did actually hear. 
although from what direction I, it proceeded, I found it impossible to say. A low and apparently distant but harsh, protracted, and almost unusual screaming or grating sound, the exact counterpart of what my fancy had already conjured up for the dragon's unnatural shriek as described by the romancer. Oppressed, as I certainly was, upon the occurrence of this second and most extraordinary coincidence, by a thousand conflicting sensations in which wonder and extreme terror were predominant, I still retained sufficient presence of mind to avoid exciting, by any observation, the sensitive nervousness of my companion. I was by no means certain that he had noticed the sounds in question, although, assuredly, a strange alteration had, during the last few minutes, taken place in his demeanor. From a position fronting my own, he had gradually brought round his chair, as so to sit with his face to the door of the chamber, and thus I could but partially perceive his features, although I saw that his lips trembled, as if he were murmuring inaudibly. His head dropped upon his breast, yet I knew that he was not asleep, from the wide and rigid opening of the eye as I clasped, caught a glance of it in profile. The motion of his body, too, was at variance with this idea, for he rocked from side to side with a gentle yet constant and uniform way. Having rapidly taken notice of all this, I resumed the narrative of Sir Lancelot, and thus proceeded. And now the champion, having escaped from the terrible fury of the dragon, bethinking himself of the brazen shield, and of breaking up the enchantment which was upon it, removed the carcass from out of the way before him, and approached valorously over the silver pavement of the castle, to which the shield was upon the wall, which in sooth tarried not for his full coming, but fell down at his feet upon the silver floor, with a mighty great and terrible ringing sound. No sooner had these syllables passed my lips, as if a shield of brass had indeed at this moment <coughs> pardon me no sooner had these syllables passed my lips than as if a shield of brass had indeed at the moment fallen heavily upon a floor of silver, I became aware of a distinct, hollow, metallic, and clangorous, yet apparently muffled reverberation. Completely unnerved, I leaped to my feet, but the measured rocking of move the measured rocking movement of Usher was undisturbed. I rushed to the chair in which he sat. His eyes were bent fixedly before him, and throughout his whole countenance there reigned a stony rigidity. But, as I placed my hand upon his shoulders, there came a strong shudder over his whole person. A sickly smile quivered about his lips, and I saw that he spoke in a low, hurried, and gibbering murmur, as if unconscious in my presence. Bending closely over him, I at length drank in the hideous import of his words. I hear it, yes, I hear it, I and I have heard it. Long, 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 many minutes, many hours, many days I have heard it, yet I dared not, oh, pity me, miserable wretch I am. I dared not, I dared not speak. We have put her living in the tomb. Said I not my senses were acute? I now tell you that I've heard her feeble moments in the hollow common coffin. I heard them many, many days, days ago, yet I dared not, I dared not speak. And now, tonight, Ethelred, <laughs> breaking the hermit's door, and the death cry of the dragon, and the clangor of the shield, say rather, the rending of the coffin, and the grating of the iron hinges of her prison, and her struggles with the copper archway of the vault. Oh, whither shall I fly? Will she not be here anon? 
Is she not hurrying to upbraid me for my haste? Have I not heard her footstep on the stairs? Do I not distinguish that heavy, horrible beating of her heart? Madman! Here he sprang furiously to his feet and shrieked out his syllables, as if in the effort he were giving up his soul. Madman! I tell you that she now stands without the door! As if in the superhuman energy of his utterance there had been found the potency of a spell, the huge antique panels to which the speaker pointed threw slowly back upon the instance their ponderous and ebony jaws. It was the ro the work of a of the yeah, it was the work of the rushing gust, but then without the doors there did stand the lofty and enshrouded figure of the lady Madeline of Usher. There was blood upon her white robes, and the evidence of some bitter struggle upon every portion of her emaciated frame. For a moment she remained trembling and reeling to and fro upon the threshold, then, with a low moaning cry, fell heavily inward upon the person of her brother, and in her violent and now final death agonies bore him to the floor a corpse, and a victim to the terrors he had anticipated. From that chamber and from that mansion I fled aghast. The storm was still abroad in all its wrath as I found myself crossing the old causeway. Suddenly there was a shot along the path, a wild light, and I turned to see whence a gleam so unusual could have issued, for the vast house and its shadows were alone behind me. The radiance was that of the full, setting, and blood-red moon, which now shone vividly through that once barely discernible fissure, of which I have spoken as extending from the roof of the building in a zigzag direction to the base. While I gazed, the fissure, the, while I gazed, this fissure rapidly widened. There came a fierce breath of the wind, of the whirlwind. The entire orb of the satellite burst at once upon my sight. My brain reeled as I saw the mighty walls rushing asunder. There was a long, tumultuous shouting, sound like the voice of a thousand waters. Excuse me, pardon me. And the deep and dark tarn at my feet closed sudden, sullenly and silently over the fragments of the house of Usher. Ooh. Okay, I'm going to need to grab something real quick. But before that, let's talk about the house of Usher. And uh, <laughs> when I was first reading this, I couldn't help but picture the rapper Usher, particularly when it talked about like an affinity for music. Does anyone know whether he had this short story in mind when he picked his stage name or, or is it his real name and it's just like happy coincidence? And um, there are a couple realistic subtexts that you could add to this work. During this time period, wallpaper was really common, and a common additive to those wallpapers was arsenic to make the colors really pop. The harsh chemicals would end up fl would be so like imbued in this wallpaper that the harsh chemicals would end up even floating in the air as invisible particles, which people would br then breathe and get sick. It's very possible that something about the decorations in his home were, were killing him and driving him, you know. It was like, it was a very common way to die in the Victorian era. I know that I'm mentioning Victorian stuff, even though this is America. Um, but arsenic, and arsenic in its natural state is gray, which is what the wallpaper is described to be, what the walls are described to be colored. Although... In my opinion, if we're going to go down this route, I would guess more likely, I would guess more likely that it's the fungi in the wall because it mentioned that there was like a lot of fun, fungi in the stones. Another interpretation, which I think is very interesting, um, 
well, I'll, I'll get it in a second. Okay. And also, off topic, Shields Green was the particularly vicious shade of wallpaper. It was very green and it had, like, it, it had, like, the most arsenic in it to create that vivid, vivid green color. In the, in the book, I love the phrase that he says where he says, speaking guitar. It's a very interesting turn of phrase instead of saying playing the guitar. When I originally was reading it, I wondered if it was just a way to convey that he was playing it, or was he applying that, implying that he was awful? <laughs> he, he doesn't sing, he's, he speaks the guitar. Or perhaps, you know, it'd be interesting flavor if it meant to say that Usher's illness affected his playing in a negative way. Um, but I don't think that that's really the case. And, uh, do we think, like, like another thing that I found really interesting is some of the word choices that were in this. This came out in 1839, and he's using words like hypochondriac and satellite, which both of those words feel deeply modern to me. There were a couple other ones th that I can't remember off the top of my head now that we've finished reading the short story that also felt like, huh, that, that... It's so amazing, the evolution of language. And, uh, like, hypochondriac feels like something that might have been more created when we discovered about microorganisms and diseases. And satellite, I always felt like that was something that was, like, invented for the satellite. <laughs> you know? But it's not, apparently. Although I couldn't help, but when I saw the word satellite, there was like a brief image where I was imagining uh, the house of Usher just getting, getting wrecked by an actual like modern satellite that had somehow transported itself to 1839 and just wrecking a mansion. I know that that's not what they meant. Satellite in the older, as far as I can find, satellite the older definition was just something like a flying object. So, like, it's, it's something like that, which makes it make sense that we eventually adopted it for our space satellites. And I guess, like, it, from that point forward, like, that's what it meant now. <laughs> Sometimes it's amazing what sort of, Things happen that just become like word killers. Or more accurately, word like changes the definition of the word and makes it so that any time that you try to use that older definition, like it just, it don't, it don't, it don't happen. Like, uh, off the top of my head, the only thing I can think of is the, the usage of the word gay, <laughs> meaning homosexual rather than, uh, how it meant in the fifties, which was joy. But they're happy anyway. So, do you think we are viewing the ending from the eyes of madness? Uh, madness being like the, the old-fashioned like thing. Not really. I think that like, ma like using madness as a general term, not exactly like my cup of tea because like. Anyway, uh, like someone who's. In this case, let's just say someone who's ill. A lot of people, when they say like, oh, it's insane, oh, this is madness, I get kind of irritated, I suppose. Not irritated, but I do kind of feel a sting of like feeling a little hurt because it does feel ableist to me because for context, I have bipolar disorder. And, um, for a long time, it didn't used to bother me, but then I realized that it's because, to me, my symptoms make sense to me. I'm not the vague stereotype, and so it didn't occur to me that when people say, oh, that's crazy, they are thinking of me. When people say, oh, that's crazy, or oh, that's insane, or oh, this, what they're trying to say is that something is unfathomable and unable to be understood because of how outside of the realm of normal it is. And that implies that me, as someone with bipolar disorder, that I don't make sense. 
and that I can't be understood and that I am too outside of the norm to be have rational sympathy. But the thing is, is as someone with bipolar disorder, my symptoms make sense within their diagnosis and I can be understood. I'm not unfathomable to behold when I am ill. And that's why I don't like the usage of those words. Um, but continuing on, did uh, do you think Usher attempted to kill his sister and the main character was ignorant? Or when I was reading it the first time, I had like, or perhaps the artistry becomes real in the Usher mansion and that's why there was like such a affinity for it. But reading it this, this time through, I, I, I came up with a concept of a theory of like a, an interesting theory of like the maybe the part of the reason why Usher was so insistent on the mold being alive was it was and it's connected to the vapor that comes up and when the vapor comes up there has to be some sort of sacrifice in order to make sure that it goes away and doesn't like destroy the house and that's why it's traveled from <coughs> Sorry, that's why they're like this thing of like maybe there was like a human sacrifice thing that went down from father to son, father to son, and maybe this generation, like like every generation, had twins, like some sort of magic thing that like kept them having their mansion, kept their wealth, and been able to do what they want to do. And they have to do that when the mist comes up. And it would be really interesting if part of the reason why the house came down and everybody died was because he didn't kill his sister. He thought he did, but he didn't. And, uh, so... It's an interesting idea, although I'm not sure that it's really, like, what I, the theory that I just made is like, I'm not sure it's actually supported in the text. But I am going to go grab something real quick. I need, I, I think I need to get some tissues. So I'll be right back.
Welcome back, everyone. I had to... I, I wanted to... I needed to grab some tissues. So. I, uh... Oh. I hope I'm not coming down with something, but... And, uh, thank you for those of you who have been patient while I've, uh, sound a little bit, just a little bit sick, but I hope I'm not, I don't think I'm gonna go, uh, it might be just like allergies or whatever, I don't know, but it is what it is. So, we are going to be reading... The Mask of the Red Death. The Mask of the Red Death. The Red Death had long devastated the country. No pestilence had ever been so fatal or so hideous. Blood was, blood was its avatar and its seal, the redness and the horror of blood. There were sharp pains and sudden dizziness and then profuse bleeding at the pores with dissolution. The scarlet stains upon the body and especially upon the face of the victim were the pest, pest ban which shut him out. The scarlet stains upon the body, and especially upon the face of the victim, were the best for the pest ban which shut him out from the aid and from the sympathy of his fellow men. And the whole seizure, progress, and termination of the disease were the incidents of half an hour. But the Prince Prospero was happy and dauntless and sagacious. When his dominions were half depopulated, he summoned to his presence a thousand hale and light-hearted friends from among the knights and dames of his court, and with these retired to, to the deep seclusion of one of his castle, castellated abbeys. This was an extensive and magnificent structure, the creation of the prince's own eccentric yet august taste. A strong and lofty wall girdled it in, the wall had gates of iron. The courtiers, having entered, brought furnaces and massy hammers and welded the bolts. They resolved to leave means neither of ingress nor egress to the sudden impulses of despair or of frenzy from within. The abbey was amply provisioned. With such precautions, the courtiers might bid defiance to contagion. The external world could take care of itself. In the meantime, it was folly to grieve or to think. The prince had provided all of the appliances of pleasure. There were buffoons, they were, there were buffoons, there were improvisatory, there were ballet dancers, there were musicians, there was beauty, there was wine. All these and security were within, without the Red Death. It was toward the close of the fifth or sixth month of his seclusion, and while the pestilence raged most furiously abroad, that the Prince Prospero entertained his thousand friends at a masked ball of the most unusual magnificence. It was a voluptuous scene, that masquerade, but first let me tell of the rooms in which it was held. There were seven, an imperial suit, in many places, however, Whoops. In many play palaces, however, such suits form a long and straight vista, while the folding doors slide back nearly to the walls on either hand, so that the view of the whole extent is scarcely impeded. Here the case was very different, as might have been expected from the Duke's love of the bazaar. The apartments were so irregularly disposed that the vision embraced but little more than one at a time. There was a sharp turn at every twenty or thirty yards, and at each turn a novel effect. 
to the right and left in the middle of each wall a tall and narrow gothic window looked out upon a closed corridor which pursued the windings of the suit the windows were of stained glass whose color varied in accordance with the prevailing hue of the decorations of the chamber into which it opened that and the eastern extremity was hung for example in blue and vividly blue were its windows the second chamber was purple in its ornaments and tapestries, and there and there, here the panes were purple. The third was green throughout, and so were the encasements. The fourth was furnished and lighted with orange, the fifth with white, and the sixth, the sixth with violet. The seventh apartment was closely shrouded in black velvet tapestries that hung all over the ceiling and down the walls falling in heavy folds upon the carpet of the same material and hue. But in this chamber only, the color of the windows failed to correspond with the decorations. The panes here were scarlet, deep blood color. Now in no one of the seven apartments was there any lamp or candelabrum, amid the profusion of golden ornaments that lay scattered to or f and fro or depended from the roof. There was no light of any kind emanating from lamp or candle within the suit of chambers. But in the corridors that followed the suit, there stood opposite to each window a heavy tripod, bearing a brazier of fire that protect, projected its rays through the tinted glass and so glaringly illuminated the room. And thus were produced a multitude of gaudy and fantastic appearances, but in the western or black chamber the effect of firelight that streamed upon the dark hangings through the blood plains was so was ghastly in the extreme and produced so wild a look upon the countenances of those who entered that there were few of the company bold enough to set within its precincts at all it was in this apartment also that there stood against the western wall a gigantic clock of ebony its pendulum swung to and fro with heavy monot with a dull, heavy, monotonous clang, and when the ha minute hand made the circuit of the face, and the hour was to be stricken, there came from the brazen lungs of the clock a sound which was clear and loud and deep and exceedingly musical but of so peculiar a note and empathy, emphasis that at each lapse of an hour the musicians of the orchestra the musicians of the orchestra were constrained to pause momentarily in their performance to hearken the sound and thus the waltzers preference ceased their evolutions and there was a brief disconcert of the whole gay company and while the chimes of the clock yet rang it was observed that the giddiest grew pale, and the more aged and sedate passed their hands over their brows as if in confused reverie or meditation. But when the echoes had fully ceased, a light laughter at once pervaded the assembly. The musicians looked at each other and smiled as if their own smiled as if at their own nervousness and folly, and made whispering vows each to the other, that the next chiming of the clock should produce them no similar emotion. And then, after the lapse of sixty minutes, which embrace three in them, no similar emotion, and then... Wait. After the lapse of sixty minutes, which embrace three thousand and six hundred seconds of time that flies, there came yet another chiming of the clock, and then there was the, then there were the same disconcert and tremulous and meditation as before but in spite of these things it was a gay and magnificent revel the tastes of the duke were peculiar he had a fine eye for colors and effects he disregarded the decora of mere fashion his plans were bold and fiery and his conceptions glowed with barbaric luster there are some who would have thought him mad. His followers felt that he was not. It was necessary to hear and see and touch him to be sure that he was not. He had directed in great part 
the movable embellishments of the seven chambers, upon occasion of this great feat, and it was his own guiding taste which had given character to the masqueraders. Be sure they were grotesque. There were much glare and glitter and piquancy and phantasm, much of what has since has been since seen in Hernani. There were arabesque figures with unsuited limbs and appointments. There were delirious fancies such as the madman fashions. There was much of the beautiful, much of the wanton, much of the bizarre, something of the terrible, and not little of that which might have excited disgust. To and fro in the seven chambers there stalked, in fact, a multitude of dreams, and these... The dreams writhed in and about, taking hue from the rooms and causing the wild music of the orchestra to seem as the echo of their steps. And on, there strikes the ebony clock which stands in the hall of the velvet. And then, for a moment, all is still and all is silent save the voice of the clock. The dreams are stiff frozen as they stand, The dreams are stiff frozen as they stand, but the echoes of the chime die away. They have endured but an instant, and a light, half-subdued laughter floats after them as they depart. And now again the music swells, and the dreams live and writhe to and fro more merrily than ever, taking hue from the many tinted windows through which stream the rays from the tripods. But to the chamber which lies westwardly of the seven, there are now none of the maskers who venture, for the night is waning away, and there flows a rud ruddier light through the blood-covered panes, and the blackness of the sable drapery appalls, and to him whose foot falls upon the sable carpet there comes from the near clock of the ebony in a muffled peal more solemnly emphatic than any which reaches their ears who indulge in the more remote gaieties of the other apartments. But these other apartments were densely crowded, and in them beat feverishly the heart of life, and the revel went whirlingly on, until at length at length there commenced the sounding of midnight upon the clock. And then the music ceased, as I have told, and the evolutions of the waltzers were quieted, and there was an uneasy cessation of all things as before. But now there were twelve strokes to be sounded by the bell of the clock, and thus it happened, perhaps, that more of thought crept, with more of time, into the medication, med, med, meditations of the thoughtful among those who reveled. And thus, too, it happened, perhaps, that because the last echoes of the last chime had utterly sunk into silence, there were many individuals in the crowd who had found leisure to become aware of the presence of a masked figure which had arrested the attention of no single individual before. And the rumor of this new presence having spread itself whisperingly around, there arose at length from the whole company a buzz, a murmur expressive of disappro disapprobation and surprise, and finally of terror, horror, and disgust. In an assembly of phantasms such as I have painted, it may well be supposed that no un that no ordinary appearance could have excited such sensation. In truth, the masquerade license of the night was nearly unlimited, but the figure in question had out-Heroded Herod, and gone beyond the bounds of even the prince's indefinite decorum. There are chords in the hearts of the most reckless which cannot be touched without emotion. Even with the utterly lost, to whom life and death are equally jest, there are matters of which no jest can be made. The whole company, indeed, seemed deeply to feel that in the costume and bearing of the stranger neither wit nor propriety existed. The figure was tall and gaunt, and shrouded from head to foot in the habiliments of the grave. 
The mask which concealed the vidge's vi visage was made so nearly to resemble the countenance of a stiffened corpse that the closest scrutiny must have had difficulty in detecting the cheat. And yet all this might have been endured, if not approved, by the mad revelers around. But the mummer had gone so far to assume the type of the Red Death. His vesture was dabbled in blood, and his broad brow, with all the features of the, pay of the face, must be sprinkled with the scarlet horror. When the eyes of the Prince Prospero fell upon this spectral image, which with a slow and solemn movement, as if more fully to sustain its role, stalked to and fro among the walt waltzers, he was seen to be convulsed in the first moment with a strong shudder either of terror or distaste, but in the next his brow reddened with rage. Who dares? he demanded hoarsely of the courtiers who stood near him. Who dares insult us with this blasphemous mockery? Seize him and unmask him! That way we may know who we have to hang at sunrise from the battlements. It was in the eastern or blue chamber in which stood the Prince Prospero as he uttered these words. They rang throughout the seven rooms loudly and clearly, for the prince was a bold and robust man, and the music had become hushed at the waving of his hand. It was in the blue room where the prince, with a group of pale courtiers by his side, First, as he spoke, there was a slight rushing movement of this group in the direction of the intruder, who at the moment was also near at hand, and now, with deliberate and stately step, made closer approach to the speaker. But from a certain nameless awe with which the mad assumptions of the mummer had inspired the whole party, there found none who put forth hand to seize him, so that, unimpeded, he passed within a yard of the prince's person, and while the vast assembly, as if with one impulse, shrank from the centimeters of the room to the walls, he made his way uninterruptedly, with the same solemn and measured step which had distinguished him from the first, through the chamber to the purple, through the purple to the green, through the green to the orange, through this again to the white, and even thence to the violet, here a decided movement had been made to arrest him. It was then, however, that the Prince Prospero, maddening with rage and the shame of his own momentary cowardice, rushed hurriedly through the six chambers, while, while none followed him on account of a deadly terror that had seized upon all. He bore aloft a drawn dagger and approached in rapid impetuosity to within three or four feet of the retreating figure, when the latter, having attained the extremity of the velvet apartment, turned suddenly and confronted his pursuer. There was a sharp cry, and the dagger dropped gleaming upon the sable carpet, upon which, instantly afterwards, fell prostrate in death the Prince Prospero. Then, summoning the wild courage of despair, a throng of the revelers at once threw themselves into the black apartment, and seizing the mummer, whose tall figure stood erect and motionless within the shadow of the ebony clock, gasped in an unutterable horror at finding the grave cerements and corpse-like mask which they handled with so violent a rudeness, untentated by any tangible form. And now was acknowledged the presence of the Red Death. He had come like a thief in the night, and one by one dropped the revelers in the blood-bedewed hall of their revel, and died each in the despairing posture of his fall. And the life of the ebony clock went out with that of the last of the gay, and the flames of the tripods expired, and darkness and decay, and the Red Death El illimitable dominion over all. Woo! How grim. I find it neat how some, how is, like, 
I find it neat how it's a story written by someone in the 1800s. At the time I first read this, I thought that the story took place much earlier than 1842, which is when this story was written, uh, due to the presence, the, the mention of knights. But also, I this reading I caught the reference that at this party, at this ball, there are ballet dancers, which ballet, I believe, was not invented until the 1800s. I don't want to check. I'll check. <laughs> All right, I'm checking. Oh, okay. I was wrong. It is not 1800s. It ballot is formalized. It is from the 15th and 16th centuries. But I do find it really interesting. I find it really interesting that it's a story alluding to something much earlier. I suppose royalty still existed in 1842, but... You know, what time period do you think it takes place in? Uh, originally, I was conjuring up an image of something a bit more medieval. Uh, and I suppose the Tudor period is the 14th century, I believe. But the Red Death, like the fact that the Red Death is alluding to something like the bubonic plague, because that plague back then was called the Black Death. Um, the, but yeah, like, I find it really interesting. I think I'm imagining it, going to imagine it more in that like 15th, 16th period, because ballet dancers, I, I got confused because I think ballet didn't really start becoming a respectable dance until like, I think the 1800s because uh, the shape of the tutus like showed so much of the legs that it was considered uh, kind of promiscuous and kind of more more in the vein of things that prostitutes do, if I remember correctly. Um, also, fun fact, did you know that there is an actual disease that causes you to leak blood from your pores? It's called hematidrosis is when the blood vessels that connect to your sweat glands, they rupture, causing blood to leak out instead of sweat. And interesting, interestingly enough, extreme levels of fear and stress can trigger it, almost like seeing like a, 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 a terrifying specter that is supposed to represent something that's going to that's gonna make you die. So that makes me like wonder whether like the the creature caused the disease just by fear alone. But it's it's more likely that it's 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 magic, not just fear. What do you think? And now let us continue to our final short story for tonight. And that will be that will be the cask of Amontillado. The thousand injuries of Fortunato I had borne as best I could, but when he ventured upon insult, I vowed revenge. You, who so well know the nature of my soul, will not suppose, however, that I gave utterance to a threat. At length I would be avenged. This was not, this was a point definitively settled, but the very definitive, definitive, let me get some water. Yep, sorry. Drink of water and a thousand burps. 
Ugh. You, who so know, who so well know the nature of my soul, will not suppose, however, that I gave utterance to a threat. At length I would be avenged. This was a point definitely, definitively settled, but the very definitiveness with which it was resolved precluded the idea of risk. I must not only punish, but punish with impunity. A wrong is unredressed when retribution overtakes its redresser. It is equally unredressed when the avenger fails to make himself felt, as such to him who has done the wrong. It must be understood that neither by word nor deed have I had I given Fortunato cause to doubt my goodwill. I continued, as was my wont, to smile in his face, and he did not perceive that my smile now was the thought of his immolation. He had a weak point, this Fortunato, although in other regards he was a man to be respected and feared. He prided himself on his connoisseur ownership in wine. Few Italians have the true virtuoso spirit. For the most part, their enthusiasm is adapted to suit the time and the opportu and opportunity to practice imposture upon the British and Austra Austrian millionaires. In painting and gemmary, Fortunato, like his countrymen, was a quack. But in the matter of old wines, he was sincere. In this respect, I did not differ from him materially. I was skillful in the Italian vintages myself, and bought largely where, whenever I could. It was about dusk one evening, during the supreme madness of the carnival season, that I encountered my friend. He accosted me with excessive warmth, for he had been drinking much. The man wore motley. He had on a tight-fitting party-striped dress, and his head was surmounted by the conical cap and bells. I was so pleased to see him that I thought I should never have done wringing his, never have done wringing his hand. I said to him, "My dear Fortunato, you are luckily met. How remarkably well you were looking today! But I have received a pipe of what passes for a montalado, and I have my doubts." How? He said, "A montalado, pipe." "'Impossible! But in the middle of the carnival?' "'I have my doubts,' I replied, "'and I was silly enough to pay the full Amontillado price "'without consulting you in the matter. "'You were not to be found, and I was fearful of losing a bargain. Amontillado. "'I have my doubts. Amontillado, "'And I must satisfy them. Amontillado. "'As you are engaged, I am on my way to Lucchesi, if any of you has a critical turn, it is he. He will tell me Luta Lucchesi cannot tell Amontillado from Sherry. And yet some fools will have it that his taste is a match for your own. Come, let us go. Whither? To your vaults. My friend, no. I will not impose upon your good nature. I perceive you have an engagement. Lucchesi, I have no engagement. Come. My friend, no, it is not the engagement, but the severe cold with which I perceive you are afflicted. The vaults are insufferably damp. They are encrusted with nitre. Let us go. Nevertheless, the cold is merely nothing. Amontillado, you have been imposed upon, and for Lucchesi he cannot distinguish Sherry from Amontillado. Thus speaking, Fortunato impress possessed himself of my arm, putting on a mask of black silk, the drawing a roncolaire closely about my person, I suffered him to hurry me to my palazzo. There were no attendants at home, they had absconded to make merry in honour of the time. I had told them that I should not return until the morning, and had given them explicit orders to not not to stir from the house. These orders were sufficient, I well knew, to ensure their immediate disappearance, one and all, as soon as my back was turned. I took from their sconces two flambeaux, and giving one to Fortunato, bowed him through several suits of rooms to the archway that led into the vaults. I passed down a long and winding staircase, requesting him to be cautious as he followed. We came at length to the foot of the descent, 
and stood together on the damp ground of the catacombs of the Montressors. The gait of my friend was unsteady, and the bells on his cap jingled as he strolled. The pipe, said he. It is farther on, said I, but observe the white webwork which gleams from the cavern walls. He turned toward me and looked into my eyes with the two filmy orbs that distilled the room of intoxication. Nitra? he asked at length. Nitra, I replied. How long have you had that cough? <laughs> my poor friend found it impossible to reply for many minutes. It is nothing, he said at last. Come, I said with decision. We will go back. Your health is precious. You are rich, respected, admired. Beloved, you are happy as I once was. You are not a man to be missed. For me it is no matter. We will go back. You will be ill. I cannot be responsible. Besides, there is Lucchesi. Enough, he said. The cough is mere nothing. It will not kill me. I shall not die of a cough. True. True, I replied, and indeed I had no intention of alarming you unnecessarily, but you should use all proper caution. A draught of Madoc will defend us from the damps. Here I knocked off the neck of a bottle, which I drew from a long row of its fellows that lay upon the mould. Drink, I said, presenting him the wine. He raised it to his lips with a leer. He paused and nodded to me familiarly while his bells jingled. I drink. To the, he said, to the buried that repose around us. And I to your long life. He took my arm and we proceeded. These vaults, he said, are extensive. The Montressors, I replied, were a great and numerous family. I forget your arms. A huge human foot do door in a field azure. The foot crushes a serpent rampant whose fangs are embedded in the heel. And the motto? Nemo mel impune lacid. Good, he said. The wine sparkled in his eyes and the bells jingled. My own fancy grew warm with the Madoc. We had passed through walls of piled bones, with casks and puncheons intermingling into the inmost recesses of the catacombs. I paused again, and this time made bold to seize Fortunato by, the ar by an arm above the elbow. The nitre, I said. See, it increases. It hangs like moss upon the vaults. We are below the river's bed. Drops of moisture trickle among the bones. Come, we will go back ere is too late. Y your cough. It is nothing, he said. Let us go on. But first, another draught of the Madoc. I broke and reached, reached him a flagon of the de Grave. He emptied it in a breath. He emptied it at a breath. His eyes flashed with a fierce light. He laughed and threw the bottle upwards with a gesturation I did not understand. I looked at him in surprise. He repeated the movement, a grotesque one. You do not comprehend? He said. Not I, he replied. Then you are not of the Brotherhood. How? You are not of the Masons. Yes, yes, I said. Yes, yes. You? Impossible! A mason? A mason, I replied. A sign, he says. It is this, I answered, producing a towel, pr producing a trowel from beneath the folds of my roquelaire. You jest, he exclaimed, recoiling a few paces. But let us proceed to the amontillado. Be it so, I said, replacing the tool beneath the cloak, and again offering him my arm. He leaned upon it heavily. We continued our route in search of the Amontillado. We passed through a range of low arches, descended, passed on and descending again, arrived at a deep crypt, 
in which the foulness of the air caused our flambeau rather to glow than flame. At the most remote end of the crypt there appeared another less spacious. Its walls had been lined with human remains, piled to the vault overhead, in the fashion of the great catacombs of Paris. Three sides of this interior crypt were still ornamented in this manner. The fourth the bones had been from the fourth the bones had been thrown down and lay promiscuously upon the earth, forming at one point a mound of some size. Within the wall thus exposed by the displacing of the bones, we perceived a still interior recess, in depth about four feet, in width three, in height six or seven. It seemed to have been constructed for no especial use in itself, but formed merely the interval from the two of the colossal supports of the roof of the catacombs, and was backed by one of their circumscribing walls of solid granite. It was in vain that Fortunato, lift, uplifting his dull torch, endeavored to pry into the depths of the recess. recess. Its terminate its termination the feeble light did not enable us to see. Proceed, I said, herein is the amontillado. As for Lucchesi, he is an ignoramus, interrupted my friend, as he stepped unsteadily forward, while I followed immediately at his heels. In an instant he had reached the extremity of the niche, and finding his progress arrested by the rock, stood stupidly bewildered. A moment more and I had fettered him to the granite. In its surface were two iron staples, distant from each other about two feet horizontally. From one of these depended a short chain, from the other a padlock. Throwing the links about his waist, it was but the work of a few seconds to secure it. He was too astounded to resist. Withdrawing the key, I stepped back from the recess. "'Pass your hand,' I said. "'Over the wall you cannot heal. help feeling the nitra. "'Indeed, it is very damp. "'Once more, let me implore you to return. "'No? "'Then I must positively leave you. "'But I must first render you all the little attentions in my power.' "'The Amontillado!' ejaculated my friend, "'not yet recovered from his astonishment. "'True, the Amontillado.' As I said these words, I busied myself among the pile of bones of which I have before spoken. Throwing them aside, I soon uncovered the quantity of building stone and mortar. With these materials and the aid of my trowel, I began to vigorously to wall up the entrance of the niche. I had scarcely laid the first tier of my masonry when I discovered that the intoxication of Fortunato had in great measure worn off. The earliest indication I had of this was a low moaning cry from the depths of the recess. It was not the cry of a drunken man. There was then a long, obstinate silence. I laid the second tier, and the third, and the fourth, and then I heard the furious vibrations of the chain. The noise lasted for several minutes during which, that I might hearken to it with more satisfaction, I ceased my labors and sat down upon the bones. When at last the clanking subsided, I resumed the trowel and finished without interruption the fifth, the sixth, and the seventh tier. The wall was now nearly upon level with my breast. Again I paused, holding the flambeau over the mason work, and threw a few feeble rays upon the figure within. A succession of loud and shrill screams bursting suddenly from the throat of the chained form seemed to thrust me violently back. For a brief moment I hesitated. I trembled. Unsheathing my rapier, I began to grope with it about the recess, but the thought of an instant reassured me. I placed my hand upon the solid fabric of the catacombs and felt satisfied. I reapproached the wall. I replied to the yells of him who clamored. I re-echoed. I aided. 
I surpassed them in volume and in strength. I did this, and the clamorer grew still. It was now midnight, and my task was drawing to a close. I had completed the eighth, the ninth, and the tenth tier. I had finished a portion of the last and the eleventh. There I remained but a single stone to be fitted and plastered in. I struggled with its weight. I placed it partially in its destined position. But now there came from out the niche a low laugh that erected the hairs upon my head. It succeeded by a sad voice, which I had difficulty in recognizing as that of the noble Fortunato. The voice said, <laughs> A very good joke indeed. An excellent jest. We will have many a rich laugh about the palazzo. <laughs> Over our wine. <laughs> The Amontillado, I said. <laughs> yes, the Amontillado. But is it not getting late? Will they not be awaiting us at the Palazzo? The Lady Fortunato and the rest? Let us be gone. Yes, I said. Let us be gone. For the love of God, Montressor. Yes, I said. For the love of God. But to these words I hearkened in vain for a reply. I called aloud. Fortunato! No answer. I called again. Fortunato! No answer still. I thrust a torch through the remaining aperture and let it fall within. Then came forth in return only a jingling of the bell. My heart grew sick on account of the dampness of the catacombs. I hastened to make an end to, of my labor. I forced the last stone into its position. I plastered it up. Against the new masonry, I re-erected the own, old rampart of the bones. For half a century, no mortal has disturbed them. In pace requestat. That had to be a horrible way to go. Just awful. Awful, awful, awful. And, you know, ah, yes, the meme. For those of you unaware, there was a meme on Tumblr for quite some time referencing this particular story, saying, like, making lots of posts that were saying things like, I have blank insert desirable thing, just come down to my basement. And apparently Amontillado is a light sherry. I don't really know that much about alcohol, again, since I can't drink for medical reasons, but I get the implication that it's a very nice or expensive alcohol. Uh, but I must ask my my booze drinker viewers, do you like it and how does it taste? And most of all, I, I have to say, I don't think Fortunato was deserving of death and especially not like he wasn't annoying and especially he didn't deserve that way to die. He seemed really energetic and friendly and he seems like the kind of person who would have been well loved. I would imagine that the main character um, would just like I feel like the the mur the the murder was committed due to jealousy and uh yeah and I, I mean he didn't he didn't deserve that slow death of isolation and starvation in the bitter darkness and I, I mean at least put some amontillado in the cellar let him die with the purpose he went down there to fulfill. My other thing is that maybe, like, he'll find a way out to, like... I, I hope that he would be able to, like, dig his way out. But, like, oh my goodness. That would be awful. An awful, awful, awful way to go. And, uh... That is it for our reading stream today. And thank you for coming with me on this journey. And I will be reading some more 
works by Edgar Allan Poe this Thursday. And I'm going to be streaming a little bit earlier because I want to be on a day schedule for the collab that's on Friday. So thank you guys and have a wonderful day. Let me see if I maybe pop into Twitch real quick. Um, let's raid fake emojis, which is one of the people that we I will be collabing with. All right. Have a wonderful day. Don't forget that you are loved. And don't forget to tell someone else you love them. Trust in you. It's too